All right, and welcome to those of you joining us from YouTube. We want to thank DuPage County Stormwater Management for sponsoring our webinar. Sponsors like DuPage County help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring. You can also help us keep these webinars free because at the end, you'll be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you might be interested in, like our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help TCF continue to do all the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. So um, you can also check the box to become a member and then you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. Like at our recent plant sale, our members got in a whole day early. So that was really cool. Uh, upcoming webinars, as you know, we've been doing these every week and we're gonna continue for the foreseeable future. So as long as you guys keep coming to these webinars, I'm gonna keep doing them. June 2nd, we will be joined with uh, joined by Allison Mitch, physical therapist, for another Nature RX program, Green Exercise. Why is it and why does it matter? Or what is it and why does it matter? And then on June 9th, we're going to be joined by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources to talk about the rich natural history of Northeast Illinois, federally threatened and endangered species. So if you've always wanted to learn more about those rare and endangered things that we've got going on out there. That's one not to miss. All right. With that, I am going to turn it over to our speaker, Marla Garrison. She's an instructor of biology at McHenry County College. She's the author of Damselflies of Chicagoland, published online by the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History. We'll put the link for that in the chat. And she sat on the executive council of the Dragonfly Society of the Americas for many years. That sounds like a really cool society. I want to join. Uh, she has worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the federally endangered Heinz Emerald Dragonfly Project and conducts dragonfly research and surveys throughout the state of Illinois and around the country. She is currently completing her second field guide entitled Dragonfly Nymphs of Northern Illinois. So I am very pleased to be in the presence of this dragonfly expert, Marla Garrison, who also comes to us having presented at Wild Things earlier this year. So with that, Marla, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. It worked for us before we began. Let's hope, cross fingers, everything works fine here now. And if you could just let me know whether or not you are seeing my first slide or my presentation. We are seeing the egg nymph slide. Oh. We're not on slide number one. Okay, let's see. Um, maybe if I get my glasses on, that will help because that was my fault. There we go. Are you seeing my first slide now? Yes, you're all good. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so good morning. Good afternoon, I guess. Thank you so much for participating today. I really appreciate it. The aquatic insect order Odonata, uh, which includes the two suborders, dragonflies and damselflies, has a great cultural appeal around the world. And its adults of, of this order are bright, demonstrative, uh, they easily draw your eye and attention when you're out in the field, birding, herping, lepping, or even when you're boating and fishing. However, those, um, those adults actually represent a very short period of time in the life stages of odonates. And therefore, for the past decade or so, I have focused and concentrated my attention on their somewhat less showy uh, but arguably much more significant aquatic stage. And in this stage, they are called nymphs. On the screen, there are a couple of examples of dragonfly nymphs, in fact. And it's in this stage, in this nymphal stage, where they spend the majority of their time and their ontogeny or development. And it's this stage alone that ties them inextricably to very specific aquatic ecosystems and niches. So my, my goal today with this talk is to highlight the need for understanding 
this particular stage of a dragonfly's life cycle and monitoring this stage as a means of more meaningful conservation and or restoration efforts. I've broken this talk down into two parts. And the first is the natural history of odonates with an emphasis on nymphs and their, their functional morphology. And the second part is on their conservation, looking at the diversity within Illinois and their state ranks and why they are ranked so and what we can do to change those some of those um, lower ranked species. So let's let's begin first of all by um, asking asking the question, why should we care? What's so great about dragonflies? Why conserve them? And I put to you that that dragonflies are up there as the single most perfect paradigm or example of evolutionary success on the planet Earth. In fact, we now believe the oldest living species on Earth is a dragonfly, not the horseshoe crab, but a dragonfly. And they have, um, they're just a success story. And as such, they are used for evolutionary theory and modeling. In fact, dragonflies, uh, true dragonflies showed up on the planet Earth somewhere around the um, Permian about 270 million years ago in the early Permian, actually. And they survived the Triaso-Permian extinction, which is one of the five main um, uh, extinction events on the Earth. And to date, until the current one, the most significant extinction, they made it through that. And they radiated out into wonderful variety uh, across the globe. There isn't a single freshwater habitat that you can think of on the planet Earth that does not have a subset of dragonflies or damselflies that, that can exist in it. And there's even some saline, some saltwater, brackish water species as well. So, um, so we look at them for evolutionary theory and systematics. They also play a very significant role in food webs both aquatic food webs and terrestrial. They are carnivorous in both their nymphal and adult stages and are considered generalists for the most part. There is one, there's, a, there's a handful of species in the tropics that are very specific feeders on spiders. They'll take spiders out of webs. Other than that, they are, are extreme generalists and they consume all manner of invertebrates and even some vertebrates. They have been known to take down tadpoles and, and fish and so forth in their nymph stage, their underwater aquatic stage. These nymphs actually feed at higher and higher trophic levels as they grow and develop underwater. And in some aquatic habitats, we actually see that dragonfly nymphs are the top predators in that water system. A rich odonate Fauna, however, can also greatly um, help us as, as humans deal with pest control. Dragonfly nymphs voraciously consume mosquito larvae. They, um, as adults, can take out as many as 200 mosquitoes a day. They'll take out deer fly up in the north woods and so forth. So they're, they're wonderful for, for uh, those pesky mosquitoes and, and such. That being said, they're also a rich food source for waterfowl, frogs, and fishes. I've read some, um, some studies where 65% or more of the diet of many of the migrating waterfowl is dragonfly nymphs. So, so they play a really significant role as prey as well as predators. Um, let's consider their role as indicators of aquatic habitats. Dragonflies are actually excellent aquatic habitat indicators, but I need to be careful how I state that because I'm not saying that dragonflies are always indicative, their presence indicative of high quality water um, that's, that's not what I mean, but rather they indicate the type of aquatic habitat 
in which you find them and which they have selectively evolved. So they can tell us a lot about the physical characteristics of a waterway, its, its flow rate, whether it's lentic or lodic, it's so, a substrate and um, dissolved oxygen and so forth. It's hard to determine their sensitivities to chemical pollution, however, and many of them seem to be pretty uh, resistant to chemical pollution. So I'm, I'm not going to make the bold statement that they are an indicator organism for chemical pollutants. That a lot of work yet needs to be done in that realm, but they certainly are indicators of, un, of, of undisturbed waterways in terms of physical components such as channeling uh, or, or damming. Finally, they have proven to be wonderful models for engineering and bioengineering, anywhere from aeronautical calculations in flight to the development of antimicrobials in, in healthcare, dragonflies have been used again and again and again as modeling for these various um, uh, applied sciences. So let's, uh, let's talk for a second about the, um, the monitoring and conserving of any group of organism without first having some knowledge and understanding of its natural history. That at its very best is always, or at the very least is always going to be folly. And at the very worst to begin conserving um, or, or attempting restoration on a species of which you, you don't know its natural history. It, it can be even more damaging than simply leaving that species and the other species that coexist with it alone. So it's always best to first look at natural history. And that's the first half of today's talk. The insect order Odonata, it, it literally means toothed ones. Odont means to have teeth. And they are amazing carnivores as we just discussed. But when we look at this insect order, and we look at its life cycle, it's very different than something like butterflies where you've got a four part metamorphosis from egg to larva to pupa to, um, to adult. In fact, as uh, when, when, when we consider odonates, these aquatic insects go through a hemi metabolic life cycle. To be hemi metabolists means they only have three stages in their metamorphosis. They lay eggs, they hatch into nymphs, and those eventually emerge into an imago or an adult. And we should probably at this point, I'm gonna annotate this slide. We should probably talk about the amount of time dragonflies generally spend in each of these three stages. So eggs generally, after they're oviposited, they develop over a period of about one to three weeks. And there's gonna be exceptions to all of these average time periods that I put on this slide. There are some species that overwinter in the egg form, but most species of dragonflies and damselflies overwinter as nymphs. Once those eggs hatch, you get a very, very, very small, what is called um, first instar and then second instar nymph. The instar is the, the stage of development of that nymph. And that nymph generally is on the order of one to two millimeters long. It has to go through anywhere from 11 to 15 molds to eventually get to what we call the final instar, which you're seeing over here. This is a, a so-called final instar dragonfly nymph. And you can see its wings develop. So in, the, in, in that whole developmental period from the first and second instar to the final instar, maybe taking on average 13 molts, you, you kind of are compressing the larval and the pupal stages of a holometabolic insect such as a, a, a butterfly that uses the caterpillar and then the pupa. And in the pupa, the wings develop. But in this nymphal stage, in the last five instars or so, the wings actually develop and they're right here. You can see the wing pads. And then when the wings get to be, oh, close to the hind knees here, 
on these hind legs, it's ready to emerge and become an adult or imago. So how long does it take to go through 11 to 15 molts underwater? And the answer to that question is it varies based on the type of or species of dragonfly. So in Northern Illinois, most dragonflies spend between one to two years underwater as a nymph. However, if we look at the whole range of all the species of dragonflies and damselflies on earth, I would say that the quickest development that ever happens in a species of dragonfly is five to six weeks. They can hatch and in five to six weeks, they eclose or emerge as an adult. That happens in a few species that, that have to go through really rapid nymphal development in pools, such as, um, such as in, in, in tire treads that fill up with water in the tropics. You know, those, those species really rapidly go through their nymphal development. But then at the other end of that time spectrum, we see some species may take up to seven years. The Heinz Emerald Dragonfly is known to take on average 5.6 years as a nymph. And therefore, this stage, I'm going to put an asterisk here because this is the stage that is most significant in terms of, of conservation and, and development for dragonflies. Because once they emerge from the water and they enter the terrestrial realm, they spend just two to six weeks as an adult. And that is, I'd say the average is about a month dependent on weather events and predation. It's not very long. And in that month or so, they are solely occupied in feeding, mating, laying eggs. So when we consider cons conservation of dragonflies, the nymph is the thing. That's what we need to look at. That's the part that is tied to the water system. And it is the waterway, not the terrestrial realm that we need to look at in terms of conservation of our species here in Illinois. All right, so that's the, the, the life cycle. Let's take a look now, if I can get this to work, at this in pictures and just have a look. This is a, a, a dragonfly egg in the um, top left here, and it belongs to a species known as the dragon hunter, which is present in Wisconsin. It's not present in Illinois. I collected these eggs from a female in Minnesota a couple of years ago, and I reared the eggs and the nymphs in my lab. And so I reared this, and you can see the embryo developing, and within two weeks, this egg was ready to hatch, and it hatched out, and it became this nymph, which this is taken under the microscope, and it's 1.6 millimeters from head to tail there. And so that is actually what we call the, the second instar. As it grows and develops, it starts to change. And what you're looking at on this screen are three different size cohorts of that species called the dragon hunter. And in the bottom right, you can see some smaller ones that don't quite have wing pads yet. And then you see a middle-sized teenager here, and then the final older adults with their wings, uh, their wings fully developed. And there's about, as I said, 13 stages. Obviously, I'm only showing three of those. You're not seeing the very small ones or the transitional stages there, but you get the idea. And when we look at this particular species, what I'd like you to notice is that it is a leaf mimic. The nymph is underwater, but it looks just like this hawthorn leaf in the trash at the edge of this well oxygenated lake up in Wisconsin where I took this. And it sprawls in that, that detritus and trash at the edge of these wave washed shores and it fits right in. And so it is quite cryptic. Here's another example. And to give you an idea, then here's a dip net. This dip net actually has three dragon, hunt, dragon hunter nymphs in it. I don't know if you can see them. Here's one. I hope you can see my, my cursor, but here's one. Here's the second one. And right here is the head of a third one. And you see 
how well camouflaged they are. They have evolved in that particular mix of leaf litter underwater and it hides them well so that they can hunt. So my point here is that the, those nymphs in their waterways are highly evolved to those specific substrates, something we're gonna see more of here as we continue with the natural history. Those adult dragon hunter nymphs, when they are fully developed in their final instar, they stop feeding for about a week, their wing pads swell up, and then they crawl out of the water onto rocks or emergent vegetation, up tree trunks, some species. In this case, it, it, it came up some stems of some, some rushes and, and emerges. And it emerges like a cicada. It breaks the skeleton of the, the dorsum of its thorax, and it pulls itself out. And then it's what we call a teneral. And a teneral dragonfly is not protected from much. It's still very soft and gooey. It has to pump um, the equivalent of blood called hemolymph through the veins of its wings, stretch its wings out. And those wings need a couple hours to dry out, to crisp up so it can be a strong flyer. And in this stage, it's very vulnerable. It's vulnerable to things like wave action from boats moving down rivers, which actually will wash over the emerging dragonflies and destroy them. And if you've got a synchronous emergence along a bank of a river and you've got boating traffic on the day of that synchronized emergence, you've just wiped out the whole population. So this is a really vulnerable period until they get fully fleshed out and this is the final product. So from that quarter sized um, leaf mimic final instar nymph, this is what emerged. Okay, so I study nymphs and these are uh, examples. This is what we call a habitus. It's an example of body forms of the seven different dragonfly families and the three different damselfly families that we see in Northern Illinois. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and annotate this as well. This right here is what we call a darner nymph. I don't know if you've ever heard that common term darner, but these are some of our largest dragonflies in North America. This right here is an example of a club tail nymph. So we've got, we've got darners and club tails. This is known as an emerald. This is called a petal tail. This right here is known as a cruiser. The adults cruise up and down riverine systems. Sometimes um, they'll, they'll fly a quarter mile in one direction, turn around and come back and that's their territory along the bank. And they virtually never sit down. Here, this is an example of a skimmer nymph. Rather than cruising, what it likes to do, sorry, I can't talk and write here at the same time, skimmers, tend to perch and hold territories at the edges of primarily lentic, um, which are still water habitats. And this is an example of the spike tail family, spike tails. These are damselfly nymphs. They look quite different than the dragonflies. Damselflies are very gracile compared to the robust dragonflies. They fly low. Um, in, in wetlands and along banks, and they are weak flyers. They're about the size of a toothpick oftentimes, and their nymphs are also smaller, but not necessarily shorter, as you can see here. And we have what we call the, um, the jewel wings here, and we've got here what we call the spread wings, these are three, the three families we have in Illinois. And over here, we have uh, what we call the pond damsels, and we can break them down into all sorts of different types. They are the most diverse group or family in Illinois of damselflies. So on this page, the main thing I'd like you to take away from it is simply that their body forms are quite different in these families. If you take it down to the genus, 
the body forms vary tremendously. So these are general body forms here, but even within a family, got massive diversity of genera. And then within a genus, the body forms of different species can be, um, can, can be quite diverse. Sometimes they can be quite similar though too. So why do they have these shapes? Why do they look like that? And I wanna show you a movie of a common sand dragon, final instar nymph. This particular nymph, I videotaped myself uh, digging out of a sandbar in central Illinois on a sandy shoal in the Emberus River in central Illinois back in the fall. And I just want to play this video for you and I'll talk over it as we go. But I want to show you how highly adapted the nymph is to this particular substrate. It always shows up. Do you see those little trails or tunnels there? It looks like scrawling or writing. I'm going to dig at the end of those tunnels just with my hand, not even with a dip net. And as I, as I go to the end of one of these tunnels, I find right there a dragonfly nymph. This is the only dragonfly nymph you're ever gonna find in, in Illinois on a sandbar at the end of a tunnel like that. It is highly adapted in its shape. Do you see how it's got that nice tapering shape? We'll look at it up close in a minute, but I'm gonna put it back and I want you to watch and see what it actually does here. As I place it back in the water, it's gonna make a nose dive for the sand and it immediately burrows and disappears. Here I've taken it out, I've put it in a vial and you can watch how quickly it moves through that coarse sand. Hides, keeps its little rear end at the surface. You saw it blow out some air. Dragonflies breathe through their rectum. They have gills in their rectum. So it has to keep its anal pyramid, we call that, up above the substrate. So when we look at this nymph up close, this is what it looks like. Dragonfly nymphs are incredibly gorgeous. And this is one of the most beautiful. And we've got it here in Illinois. But the only place its nymph can exist is in those shallow, clear waters where there is that sandy shoal because it has evolved certain morphological characteristics to help it function and burrow and hide, hide from predator fish, but also to hide in weight of its prey. So on this screen, you see the common sand dragon in its final instar, and you see its four legs here. Let me get my annotation tool. It's, it's four legs here, it's pro legs. These are called its meso legs. You see how short those are? And you see they're curved, and they've got all of these tufts of curved CD and those, those bristles actually help to scoop the sand out of the way. Their, their, fem or their tibi and their tarsus are, are curved and keeled and they make wonderful shovels. The head is wedge-shaped, so it just dives right in to the sand. Its wing pads are divergent. Its body is tapered and it can tunnel very easily. So when we look at something like monitoring dragonflies, it's not enough just to see an adult flying over some wetland and saying, oh, look, that belongs here because they fly for great distances. And it doesn't mean their nymphs are successful in growing and developing through to emergence in that wetland. It depends on their, um, their nymph morphology. So let's, take a look here at how, let me see if I can advance the slide, there we go. How we just broadly categorize nymphs. Dragonfly nymphs can very broadly be categorized as either burrowers, climbers, or sprawlers. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at some shapes and some morphologies of burrowers first. This is another club tail, like the common sand dragon. It's a club tail and it burrows under the substrate, under the water, and it lays in wait and it just sits there, camouflaged by just covering itself with silt 
mud, et cetera. It uses these little hooks that you see here and here on its forelegs in order to burrow. And that's an adaptation for it. If you destroy its substrate along rivers, these club tails are going to go away. They cannot burrow into clay that has been um, scoured back to that foundation from floodwaters or channeled streams, et cetera. And so if the, if the right substrate is destroyed or disturbed, then the dragonfly disappears. And, um, and so let's, let's take another look here. I'm not sure this is working. There we go. And so we looked at burrowers. Let's look at another broad category, the climbers or clingers. These have evolved to hang on to emergent vegetation or tree roots or cling to fallen, sunken, sodden logs. And they are what we call figmotactic. They have this built-in genetic behavior that when you, they, they touch something, they wrap their legs around and they hold on. So darner nymphs do this and they do this really well. This is a darner nymph of the common green darner that I, I collected and I wanted to give it something to perch on in the bottle of water I placed it in. So I stuck a pencil in and the first thing it did was grab a hold. What they do in the, the wetland or waterland where they, where they exist, waterway where they exist, is they grab a hold of stems. And as such, their bodies are cylindrical, and, like the stem. They usually camouflage very well with the greens or the browns of the emergence that they, or subaquatic vegetation that they're used to grabbing a hold of. Some of them even have the texture of bark on their cuticle because they tend to grab a hold of fallen logs and they fit right in. But they lie in wait then for prey to come to them by clinging to vegetation. So when we consider conserving dragonflies, understanding what type of, of nymph you have helps you figure out how to actually um, restore that wetland or help them in the wet waterway. You'd wanna make sure for clingers and climbers that you have a great deal of vegetation and vegetation structure around the edges of your ponds, and your rivers, and so forth. Okay, um, let's see, I'll take it back. Here's, here's a, a fawn darner, and it tends to grab a hold of tree roots that have washed out and are still hanging along the edges of banks where some of their roots are submerged. And female darners lay their eggs near there and when they hatch the nymphs grab a hold of those tree right, tree roots underwater and they go through all their development right there and they blend right in and if you dislodge them they hold up their legs they look like little bits of stick and they flow downstream until they bump into another tree root and they quickly reach out and they grab it uh, here's an example of a clinger or climber that doesn't, it's not found in Illinois, but it, uh, it is found up north. It's, it is the delicate emerald. And this tiny little thing looks exactly like the sphagnum in the bogs where you find it. So submerged sphagnum is so often brown like this. It looks hairy and you can see it's a perfect cryptic a coloration and texture to allow it to disguise itself and cling to bogs, uh, bog material. Okay, and the third broad category of nymphs are called sprawlers. Sprawlers do just that. They sprawl not, uh, they don't go under the substrate. They don't go above the substrate and vegetation. They sprawl on top of it. And they are some of the most amazing in terms of their, their design. If you look at this particular sprawler, it's called the Swift River Cruiser. And we've got that all over Illinois in our rivers. It looks like a giant spider. Its legs have evolved to be extremely long. It spreads them out. Its body is so flattened and compressed so that current as it washes over them uh, doesn't pick them up and cause them to tumble downstream. But even if it does, their, their legs help them reorient. And this is about the only group of dragonflies where I've seen them successfully. If, they're if I've placed them on their back because of those long legs, 
legs, they have a way of tipping themselves back upright so they can reorient with the, um, if they do get flooded and washed out downstream. But notice also the texture and the modeling on its back. You can imagine how these disappear into sand and gravel and, and small pebbles. They, they just go out of sight. When it, you, I've dropped them into waters and watched them float down through clear water and all of a sudden they hit the substrate below and they're gone. But you have to have that, that type of sand and gravel for them to sprawl upon because they're going to stick out like sore thumbs um, on the surface of, of mud. They sprawl so well. I took this Swift River cruiser out of a river in, in central Illinois where it, they, they hardly ever move. They just sprawl and wait for prey. And they actually, um, everything just kind of grows on them. The, the algae here just, just began growing on them. They were so still. When we look at dragonfly nymphs, another adaptive morphology that we see is with their mouth parts. We said they're carnivores as nymphs. They grab a hold of, of food and larger and larger prey as they grow. Their lower jaw here is called their labium, and they can, they can project it out with a lightning like speed. And then they open up their pelps and they grab and snare prey and they pull it back to their to their rest of their mouth. And so you can see some of them have these cups, we call them a mask that covers those, those mouth parts and others have a flat labium with some very piercing uh, palpal sharp probes that grab and pierce prey such as minnows, tadpoles. Uh, when they get large, they can take snails out of shells with those really, really amazing predators. When we look at the spike tails, the spike tails have the most fabulous labial palps of anything. The first spike tail I ever pulled out of a, a, a bank, muddy bank, I, I held it up, looked at that mouth, and I thought, I'm going to need a bigger net. That, that was just so amazing to me. So they, they can snare and hang on to their food and then they, they just take it down. But those are adaptations and whether it's a mask cupped labium or a flat piercing labium depends on a lot on whether they're burrowers or whether they're climbers um, and different, whether they're, they're still water or, or flowing water. Okay. So we can look at their abdomens. The abdomens can be very, very different. This is an Eastern pond hog, very common species in Illinois. It's got this round, short pill-like pill abdomen. When you pick them up out of the net, they feel like Pez candy. When you look over here, this is not an Illinois species, but look at this final segment 10 on their abdomen. Long snorkel-like. This is a burrower. It, it's, its rear end down here is way far away from its mouth when it's burrowed. So, th so there's lots of adaptation there, but there's a difference in whether it's clinging to vegetation or it's burrowing in soft mud or, or, or um, coarser substrate. Another thing about their abdomen on cross section, you can see this is more cylindrical. A lot of clingers or climbers have the cylindrical abdomen that mimics the stem of, of the, the, the emergent, whereas the sprawlers tend to have very flattened abdomens. Also take a look at these these hooks here. When you look at the side of some dragonflies, you see they have what we call mid-dorsal hooks. Mid-dorsal hooks are not present on all dragonflies, but when they are present, we generally see that that particular nymph has evolved in the presence of fish. And fish are predators of dragonfly nymphs. And so this is a protection along with these spines here, we call these posterior lateral spines, so that if a, a fish comes up and starts to suck in that dragonfly, it feels like a fish hook and they may spit it out. That's the idea there. So when we are conserving dragonflies and we see that ponds are stocked with fish, especially, what are they called? The centrarchid fish like black bass and bluegill and sunfish. They, there are a lot of dragonfly species that, that cannot coexist with those fish. So stocking fish for sports uh, fishing has been a problem for some species of dragonflies. So now that you've seen the functional morphology, um, some examples of functional morphology in nymphal 
anatomy. Let's have a look around the state of Illinois. I took this map from the Illinois. This is courtesy of the Illinois Natural History Survey, and it is a natural divisions map of Illinois. And I just want to show you that every dragonfly or damselfly listed on our state list is not going to be found in every every area of Illinois, and we wouldn't expect it to be. And it's okay a lot of times for that particular species not to be present, for example, in northeastern Illinois, because its nymphal aquatic habitat and substrate and physical parameters of the waterway are simply not present in northeastern Illinois and never were. So when when we look at um, at just a few examples here of dragonflies that are present in various divisions, natural divisions of Illinois, we've got things like the elfin skimmer. The elfin skimmer is only known from two calcareous fens in northeastern Illinois. That's the only place we've got these calcareous fens that have a certain temperature of groundwater bubbling up into shallow uh, waters. And that's why the elfin skimmer is there. It was never present in Illinois to any great degree, but there's only two populations in the state. So it's listed as state threatened, but its specific habitat was not present in the rest of the state. So that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that we have to try and restore habitat for it. When we look at another um, nymph called the gray petal tail, this is that species of dragonfly that the molecular clock data suggests has been on the planet for 103 million years and unchanged. We have it flying in the central eastern portion of Illinois, but in very, very specific habitats. Its nymph comes up out of the water and lives under moist, wet leaf litter and in sphagnum around seeps certain types of seeps that we find only on the edge with Indiana in central Illinois. And, um, and so it's got a really specific niched habitat and you will never find this petal tail up in Chicagoland or in the Grand Prairie area of Illinois and we wouldn't expect it there. When we look, for example, at the smoky shadow dragon, what a great name. Shadow dragons come out for about 45 minutes in the summertime at dusk from about maybe 8, 8 15 to nine o'clock. And they, they feed, they mate, they lay their eggs in that 45 minutes and then they go roost for the rest of the day. So we call them shadow dragons. They live only in large rivers with, with rapids and riffles. Gotta have a lot of rocks in them to make those riffles. The females wanna um, lay their eggs there and and so you don't expect them in smaller streams and rivers, but along the Mississippi, that's, that's where you can find them. Um, when we look at the Eastern ringtail, this was a species that I have seen the adults of for years in Illinois, even up into Will County and parts of Chicagoland, I found this beautiful adult ringtail dragonfly but I've never been able to find the nymph until last fall. And I, um, I was dip netting the, the Mizan River in central Illinois. And I did this because uh, an entomologist told me he'd seen adults by that river. So I went in November to find some final instars. And I finally found the, the substrate and the locale for this nymph. And I had never been able to identify that. It's never present in great abundance in Illinois, but knowing now exactly what substrate it needs, what kind of sinuosity it needs on the river, what other vegetation, what other biotic, biological components were present, um, that, that's important. And now I can look for that and really get an idea of if it is, if it is thriving in other rivers where, um, where those original requirements are, might might have been. Okay, so the nymph the nymph has evolved, excuse me, the nymph has evolved for its habitat. But even within um, within families, there are nymphs that look almost identical. For example, on this screen, you see the fawn darner and the springtime darner. 
and their nymphs are virtually indistinguishable except for this pale spot you see on segment eight of the of the dorsal abdomen of the fawn darner. And so it's really, it really brings up the question, if they're so alike, are they inhabiting, inhabiting the exact same substrates and, and um, waterways? And in fact, we may find them both in the same waterway, but in that waterway, they've niched themselves out. And so you find fawn darners clinging to roots, submerged roots of trees along banks. And they're very, very present, uh, very abundant in Illinois. Springtime darner, not so abundant in central Illinois, uh, more abundant in the south, but they'll be in the same river, but only where you've got living vegetation submerged vegetation because they cling to that. So there's a little bit different niche, even in the same rivers. And the next thing I'd like to show you is a map here of, of these two dragonfly uh, species distribution ranges. And remember that, well, when we look at maps here going into conservation, the species distribution range depends basically on two things, the, the depth of its niche and the breadth of its dispersal behavior. And so when we look here at this map, I've taken it first of all from Odonata Central. And I'd encourage all of you to go to odonatacentral.org. It is a clearinghouse for all North American dragonfly sightings and data. It's like iBird. And if you've got a, a, a sighting, you can upload a photo, it's vetted. And then if it's approved, that, that locality, that GPS coordinate is registered on the map. So this is really a dynamic, website keeping range maps up to date. But I'm going to draw your attention over here to the right where you see the um, the legend. Anywhere you see orange, those are counties, thank you, those are counties where um, where we have historical data. Anywhere you see green or blue, those are current sightings. Those are in the last 50 years. So we see with the fawn darn, darner, it's all over the pl uh, place. <clears throat> but uh, excuse me, we see here with the fawn darner in Illinois, uh, sorry, this is the springtime darner. Springtime darner, we have very few sightings. We see with the fawn darner, we have lots of sightings in lots of places. That has to do with the lack of vegetation structure we now have on our Illinois rivers. So now let's, let's look at the natural history considerations now that we know it. We need to consider the physical features of the aquatic habitat, its flow rate, sinuosity, its substrate, its turbidity, we need to know that bottom substrate inside and out. We need to know what kind of vegetation structure we have, uh, what other members of the biotic community are present, which like fish or herps that may affect um, dragonfly nymphs. And what are their emergence patterns in voltinism? Voltinism means how many broods do they have a year? Are they uni, bi, semi? Um, you know, how many how many broods do they go through? And are they synchronous or asynchronous in their emergence? So let's consider conservation state status, the Illinois state ranking system. I want to take a look at the distribution of these ranked species and what factors affect their rank. When we Rank, I'm sure you all know that ranking species, we use this um, state system of S1 through S5. S3, 4, and 5 are demonstrably secure. So when we look at all of the Illinois species of dragonflies and damselflies, we see by far the majority are secure in the state. But the ones that are of more concern are the S1 and S2s. That means they just have a couple of populations or they may have multiple populations but are in very low numbers. There's only one federally listed endangered species, the Heinz emerald. But the question I have is, if you're an S1 or S2, should we conserve you? Should we be worried about you? And that depends. That question is tough to answer. Let's first get a feel here for what, I, what uh, their, their distributions of some species look like and why they look this way. The common whitetail is what I consider one of the 10 urban trashy species that will colonize just about any habitat, anywhere. I find it absolutely everywhere. Detention ponds behind newly developed 
townhome communities are filled with this. Everywhere you look, you find this in ditches along roadsides, etc. Here's the nymph. Look at its range, historical and present. It disperses like you wouldn't believe. It's a wonderful colonizer. On the other end of the scale, we have a dispersing dragonfly that has a very tiny niche for its nymphs. And it is the Heinz Emerald dragonfly. And it is federally listed and state listed endangered. And look at its known range, very spotty. The orange is historical, it's no longer there. The green are the current remaining populations in Missouri, in Chicagoland, in Wisconsin, and up into, um, there's, there's one population, I believe in Ontario now. So, so why? why? Why does it not have such a great range like the common whitetail? And it has to do with the fact that its nymphs require seepage of groundwater over dolomite bedrock, a very specific type of Silurian deposit. And, um, and they have a symbiotic relationship with crayfish called the devil's crayfish and their nymphs have to go down and over winter deep in the crayfish burrows. So that's a pretty specific niche. And that's why it is state listed and federally listed endangered. Of course, development has removed those historical populations, draining of the hydrologic features that it requires. Here's another example, the skillet club tail. Um, this is extirpated from the state of Illinois. It was identified by Benjamin Dan Walsh, our first state entomologist along here. You can see the orange spot on Illinois. It's found in the mid 1800s by him and he named the species. It is a gorgeous dragonfly, but now it is only spottily seen up in northern Wisconsin and a few other areas. Look at all the orange historical. The only thing that's left here, the blue and the green. It's disappearing because this particular dragonfly is very sensitive to water quality. It needs large rivers with high quality. Our large river and where it was along the Mississippi and other large rivers on the west, uh, um, west side of the state, have, have lost their water quality very early on from the 1800s. That species is never coming back to Illinois. So when we look at other ranges, the river jewel wing, here's the river jewel wing, it's nymph, look at its range, it's all Northern. And when we find it, I find it in five or six spots in McHenry County, but it's listed at a low rank in the state, but for very good reason, it's nymphs need cold water and you're not going to find it down in central and southern Illinois, so we shouldn't expect to see it there. When we look at the rusty snake tail, this is, is um, something that it wasn't seen for close to 100 years. And then I found the nymph and saw the adults at the, this green square is, is mine, at the exact same spot where it was seen 100 years before. So its nymphs were still existing there. And then Winnebago County started doing monitoring and they started finding it. Well, I've dipped all through Chicagoland and in rivers here and the Kishwaukee and the Pectonica and, and the Vermilion River and I find the nymphs all the time. The reason it's listed so low isn't because it's not doing okay in the state. It's simply that it has an adult behavior where the adults are not found at the water very often and the, they'll go up and roost for most of the day and come down for a few minutes every day to the water. So it's the adult behavior that makes a difference. The Comet Darner, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop with this one here, but the Comet Darner, it's, um, it is a gorgeous dragonfly and people report it all over. And it's probably listed at a higher ranking than it should be in the state because it's a strong flyer. It flies miles and miles and miles away from its birth waters. And it's always attempting to find appropriate habitat to oviposit in. And its habitat is fishless, very, very vegetation heavy waterways. And look at how spotty it is. We find it up here, but until, um, until five years ago in King County, I'd never found the nymphs. I finally found a, a, a glacial pond that, that is a remnant in King County. It was fishless and it had tons of vegetation. And I found these nymphs growing, developing. I, I got them emerging. I found the adults ovipositing. It was all there. It was a great, great pond. And then a couple of things happened. The rusty crayfish got into it and invaded it, destroyed all the vegetation. 
and they sprayed the Phragmites and cattails for other restoration works. Those were the things that were falling over and that this particular species was ovipositing in. And now it's non-existent in that pond. So there, again, knowing that life history and so forth, I'm gonna skip these and I'm simply gonna go forward to um, factors affecting state rank and finish up. So what do we have to be cognizant of? We need to be informed on the depth of the niche and the breadth of the dispersal behavior, the scarcity of the habitat in the, in the state. Is it on its edge of its natural distribution like the Ebony Jewel or the, the, the River Jewel Wing? We wouldn't expect to see it further south. How does it migrate? Is it a colonizer? Is it expanding its range? Is climate change having an effect? Other behaviors that may result in incomplete survey data, which is the case you just saw with, um, with that snake tail. What we are really concerned about are the human disturbances. Are we draining wetlands? Are we pulling water off of aquifers for municipal water sources? Um, cooling lakes are a big one. Thermo, uh, cooling lakes for nuclear power plants are amazing in Illinois. We're starting to see Southern species survive the winter as nymphs in these warm water lakes because of the because they don't freeze over. So something called the Rambers Forktail has just in the last two years been, been seen um, growing, developing, and emerging from the, the Braidwood plant. Um, that's something to be concerned about. Trafficking and hijacking. I've seen trafficking and hijacking of a southern species of damselfly that is showing up in fisheries in Illinois and into um, surrounding areas because it's been brought in in boat traffics uh, and, and through fisheries. Fish stocking for sportsmen has changed the assemblage of dragonfly nymphs tremendously in so many natural bodies of, of water. And I think that's one of the biggest shames that we have. Uh, so for conservation, general strategies, leave ponds and shorelines well vegetated, don't mow them, and plant native aquatics, emergence, Maintain no wake zones in areas where you know you've got synchronized emergences on riverine species um, and keep the shorelines as undisturbed as, as possible. Don't stock ponds with fish, don't channel streams, stabilize banks to prevent, um, I shouldn't say flash, but to, to prevent the, the massive water running into local streams and rivers, which scours the banks and takes away all the substrate for dragonfly nymphs. And remove tiles, don't drain lowlands if you can help it. Preventing road salt runoff is big. Road salt, when it runs off, uh, increases the salinity and that's, that's a, a major problem for many, many really good dragonfly species. I'd like to thank, to end up, I'd like to thank um, the men in my life that have taught me just about everything uh, that, that I can be taught. They know a hundred times more about dragonfly nymphs. And Ken Tennyson, he's the author of Dragonfly Nymphs of North America, out by Springer. He's, he's named dozens of species to science and has hundreds of papers. That is Ken Tennyson right there. Bill Smith is right beside him. He is a Wisconsin Dragonfly Natural Resources uh, person who retired in the last two years. Um, there's these two are just when we lose those natural history minds, it is it is a true loss to humanity. They know so much, and they have been so. I've been so honored to have them teach me. Steve Valley is um, an image insect imaging expert that's taught me everything in photography and and is a great friend and Carlos Garrison my husband because he he stays with me in the field when he, everyone else would be bored stiff and he carries all my gear so with that I will just say thank you and take any questions Jamie did I overstep my time no that was fabulous we often go over a little bit we're not too particular one of the benefits of having our own webinar series as we can go over however much we want. So, and I just want to say, I only gave you that 10 minute warning because it. you told me to, I, I could have let I you ramble. go on all day. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I could have let you go all day. So I'm going to put a link to your uh, field guide there in the chat. If anybody is interested in taking a look at that, um, this was really right. great. And it was a good reminder for me 
I talk a lot to homeowners associations about ponds, trying to convince them to vegetate the shorelines of their ponds instead of mowing it all the way down to the edge. And this is a great reminder for me to mention dragonflies because of what great mosquito yeah. control they are, because that's usually another concern. And with that vegetated have. shoreline, all, da all damselflies um, deposit their eggs in plants. So they need floating matter or submerged matter or an emergence to do so. And, and when you've got a new building, a new development, they're building by my house now and they've just scoured a golf course and they're reclaiming or they're, they're not reclaiming that they're building now on that. And one thing I noticed it right off the bat, they made sure and put rocks all the way around all of the ponds that they are keeping there. And, and without vegetation, without that structure along the banks, damselflies cannot, they, they can't have a go at it. Their nymphs have to have those and, and they cling to that as well as nymphs. So damselflies are wonderful at the bottom of the food web for so many things, not just dragonfly nymphs. But you gotta get that, that damselfly um, basin and then you can move in so many other animals and so many other species of dragonflies. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Greg had a great question. He said, what other states have dragonflies? And basically all of those with water? Yeah, so or... every, every single state, there is, there's no area in the entire world where you do not find dragonflies and damselflies. They are everywhere. Every single freshwater habitat will have a subset of species. There's about 3,000 dragonfly species named to science and about 3,000 damselfly species. There's probably a couple hundred, if not a thousand or more left to go from the tropics. But you find damselfly and dragonfly nymphs even growing through to and finishing development in the little cups of bromeliads in the tropics where water, rainwater collects. They will, oh, wow. they will exist there. I, I ev absolutely everywhere. I was in a couple of years ago, I was on the border between uh, Costa Rica and Nicaragua in a, in a virgin tropical forest, but the country the year before had allowed for selective logging of this forest because they had had a massive storm and a lot of trees had blown over. So they allowed these lumber trucks to come into this forest and they left treads in and destroyed, destroyed the forest floor and they left treads that, that were you know a couple inches deep, but because of the excessive rain, they were pretty much always filled with water. And I was with an entomologist and he said, Marla, go over and dip in that, that tire tread. And we were, you know, a mile into this, this tropical forest and there were still tire treads. And so I went over and I dipped in there and I found five different species of oh, dragonfly wow. nymphs. So they, they will, they will colonize. There is Greg, a, um, there's a species of dragonfly called the wandering glider. And it's like an albatross hundreds of miles offshore, you will see it flying over open ocean with nowhere to wow. land. It is Holy considered God. a single population genetically in the entire world. One population wow. that, because they travel so far and wide, that's the ultimate colonizer. That's and it amazing. relies on temporary bodies of water to lay its eggs and mm. go through development. Amazing. Spencer wants to know, are climbers on average more vulnerable to fish predators since they are up more in the water column, even if somewhat camouflaged? Also, have any nymphs evolved to be distasteful to fish? I, I don't know about the taste, but, um, but as far as climbers, that's a really astute question, Spencer. And I would say yes, in general. The darner nymphs, are very susceptible to pred predation by fish. And so they have to camouflage on the stems and they have to uh, be careful about movement because they do not have any of those dorsal or lateral spines on their body. It's primarily, I think, rather than taste, um, although I don't know this, but I, I think it's primarily the, um, the spines that are dissuasive. Also, what um, they, they, they can move away from fish. 
by doing something called jet propulsion. So dragonfly nymphs suck water into their rectum and then they push it out and it forces them forward. So when they're being preyed upon, they do this to, to move very rapidly in different directions. When I'll pull a, a nymph out that is spiny, it'll try and poke me. They also can have long, sharp anal appendages and darner nymphs, which are susceptible, that are clingers and climbers to fish, they will do something. They'll, they'll curl their abdomen around and try and poke me with their anal pyramid because they don't have spines. But we see that uh, just like that comet darner, just it disappears in fish habitats. It, the nymphs are just eaten like crazy. That was a good question. Very. Yeah, that was, that's so interesting. So it's almost more like a, a mechanical defense as opposed yeah, to- Yeah, but when you think about burrowers, Spencer, the waterfowl that scoop up, you know, waterfowl are going to eat those bur burrowers because a lot of them with their, they're just going in and scooping, right? Or, or shoveling or scooting through and sifting through, they'll get the burrowers as well. Hmm. Very cool. Um, I'm going to read Tina's comment here. It's a little long, but I think worth it. She says, fantastic presentation. I've been to so many dragonfly courses and never have I learned so much about nymphs. Fascinating and absolutely loved every minute of it. I will be re-watching again to check my notes in case I missed something. The photography was also amazing. And I'm going to second that because I am the world's worst photographer and I love great photography. Um, if you need a student to pass on what you learned from Steve Valley, happy to step up. So that is uh, Tina, uh, DuPage County Forest Preserve Commissioner. Oh, Tina, totally. I, I actually stack nymphs now. Um for I, I do stacking photography because Steve taught me how to do all of that. And there's some amazing new Zarene software. There's some, there's even cameras in the field live that you can, you can do some stacking with, but uh, yeah, if you're interested, just shoot me an email and I will definitely show you what he taught me. The, thank you so much for that feedback. That that's really nice. I will tell you that the majority of talks I give and for the past 15 years have all been on adult dragonflies. And so that's the number one requested talk is for those beautiful, so-called beautiful adults. And I'm so glad to hear that you find the nymphs beautiful because they're actually where it's at. And I, I was, of course, when, when Jan and Jamie asked me to give this talk, I just grabbed it because any chance I've got to talk about nymphs instead of adult dragonflies, I will do. Well, yeah, and this is this was really, really fascinating because, again, like you said, so many times the focus is on those adults, but really where the conservation is at with these guys is in the, the nymphs and, and the younger ones. And I, so. and I will say that when you look at something like uh, other flying insects, like butterflies, you guys, uh, and I know Tina knows, uh, that, that when you're monitoring butterflies, for example, you're walking pollard transects and so forth, right? And you're doing counts and such. That doesn't apply to monitoring dragonflies. That, that's not, uh, dragonflies, you can, you can end up counting the same dragonfly 500 times and, or you, you get a false sense of the population. You can't do population monitoring like that. You have to either do mark and recapture, which is extremely expensive. Um, you really need to monitor if you're going to look for populations, the exuvi, those are the shed skins after they emerge. And you've got to, and you've got to be careful. You've got to get them right after they emerge. You've got to do a several sweeps of shoreline to figure out what the population is there and you need to monitor final instars because just because you see a female ovipositing on water that wandering glider will ovaposit on my turtle waxed rav4 hood and swimming pools in arizona and it won't go all the way through to development through development to eclosion to an adult so so monitoring saying well i saw them in wheel and i saw them ovipositing that doesn't mean that waterway will support them through their necessary development. So monitoring nymphs and exuvi are actually the way to go if you're looking to do anything in population and actually knowing the exact niched substrate and physical parameters of that water, that's, that's what helps with the conservation. If somebody is interested in learning more about dragonfly monitoring, where would they go to, to do that? 
So I put up these resources, field guide um, references and so forth. I will tell you guys, the very first field guide you should get is Dragonflies and Damselflies of the East by Dennis Paulson. Dennis is a remarkable um, uh, writer. He's written multiple dragonfly books, but he's also a birder. So if any of you are birders out there, he's from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and he is, uh, he's so friendly. I've been on many dragonfly uh, expeditions with this man. He, if you get a chance to meet him, he will teach you. He's the consummate educator and, um, and he, you can always fire him an email with questions. Dragonfly Nymphs of North American Identification Guide. This is Ken Tennyson's guide. That is for dichotomous keys. So that's only if you really want to dive into the science of, of it. But sitting on the Dragonfly Society of the Americas, for so many years on the executive council, we, we actually supported the Dragonfly ID app and it's a free download. I would encourage you to get that on your phone and start using it because you can actually also go into your locale and find out what dragonflies have been sighted there. What are your county records and where, what are the GPS coordinates for those? And you can submit and upload on this on your phone there. But you've also got the whole field guide and John Abbott started, started developing that throughout Nada Central. So those are some references, but here, whoops. Um, oh, criminy, sorry. Um, let me just show you very quickly. I think I put what Jamie's asking here. Can you guys still see that, the get involved? Do you see that? Okay, I'm just gonna. Yeah. Okay, so I would encourage everybody in Northern Illinois. If you're in Northern Illinois, join the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society now. That is the WDS is a truly amazing organization. We have the best field trips all over Wisconsin. And you, you go up, you meet just like-minded, wonderful people. And they will teach you everything you wanna know. They'll share their experiences, but better than ever, you get into these amazing sites and you see amazing species. They have, they work with the DNR for the Wisconsin Odonata survey. You can go on that website, go through all your species. They give you the habitat. It's an online field guide and it's an online submission. In addition, of course, I have to sponsor the Dragonfly Society of Americas because I am an active member. We have annual meetings there as well, and we meet all over the United States. So you were asking, or somebody was mentioning, I think it was Greg, about are there dragonflies in other states? Yes, and there are so many different kinds, some phenomenally gorgeous ones in the Pacific Northwest. They have the lowest diversity of any area of the United States, but they have the most unique and endemic species. And you got to get to the Pacific Northwest and see those. And then you got to go down to Texas, which has the greatest diversity. And they're all the time getting species coming up out of Mexico and, and, um, and becoming residents, actually. We're seeing a lot of changes there with climate change. They have a couple hundred different species phenomenal. But if you want to see the best club tails and, and some just really remarkable dragonflies, you go east of the Mississippi to the, to the um, northeast, east, and southeast, where the number and types of aquatic habitats are at their greatest diversity. And so um, Dragonfly Society of the Americas has regional meetings, annual regional meetings, and then they have an annual meeting Sometimes it's out of country. I organized one in Central America one year. That was, of course, the lowest attended. We only got 35 attendees, but we spent 10 days and it was awesome. And then there's one there, you know, in Canada, we had one in Saskatchewan, but most often they're in the lower 48. We need one in Hawaii. Um, but that they are just definitely worth it. I write an article with Ken Tennyson for Argia, the newsletter for Dragonfly Society of the Americas. If you are interested in nymphs, I'd encourage you to um, go to Nymph Cove. That's our ongoing episodic column in, in Argia. Friends of Hackmatack National Wildlife, if you're in the north, northern reaches of Illinois, join them and, and get out there with them. Um, backyard surveys, we really encourage them. I think, wasn't it Agassiz that said, uh, I went traveling this summer, I got as far as halfway across my backyard. And, you know, if you go out there and that's where you start, you, you'd just be amazed at, at what you can observe and, and the phenology of the dragonflies. 
and then I, I said, I would encourage everyone to go to Odenata Central. Odenata Central are where I got those maps. It's odenatacentral.org. And you can put all your sightings in there. We linked to it. It was used to be part of the DSA. We've separated those two web pages, but, um, but one of our members and his wife still maintain the Odenata Central. Uh, NK also says Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network out of the Peggy Notabart Museum coordinates dragonfly monitoring in Illinois and Indiana. Um, they do trainings and are looking for more monitors um, and also posted the IllinoisODES.org website for the Illinois Odonate Survey. Wonderful. I actually worked with Doug Taran for many years and Mel Manor in the Butterfly uh, Monitoring Network. And uh, I, I did some molecular work with Doug down at the Nature Museum. And I'm not sure who's, I think actually, I can't think of her name. Um, she, I think she's the director of the Illinois Odenata survey now. And, uh, oh, I cannot think of her name, but, uh, but they, the museum down there actually began that program. All right, great. Well, I put li those links in the chat and I realized I had sent the link to the wrong place um, for your guide through the Field Museum. So I fixed that. So that's there for folks. Uh, let's see. All right. With that, that's all the questions that we have today. I want to thank you so much, Marla. This has been utterly fascinating and has really given me a lot of things to think about and some resources I'm going to have to go check out. And as an avid field guide collector, I think I got a few more I need to add to my collection. Um, I often say field guide junkie, but that's a whole nother thing. Uh, <laughs> you can so, never have too many. Never have too many. And you know, even no matter how many apps I have, I can still, there's just something about having that field guide to flip through but you know, there's just, there's something to that. So yeah, it never, a book never runs out of electricity. So it's, it's good to have in the field. And for anybody who's still with us, if you have any questions or um, need, need any specific information on resources or whatnot, feel free to email me. It's just mgarrison at mchenry.edu. Um, I'll, I'll be gone this summer. I'm in the field working on some uh, uh, research project in Northern Wisconsin and a grant in southwestern Wisconsin for most of the summer. However, I do check in about once a week on my email. So if uh, if you want to chat, I'm always open for talking about dragonflies. It's mgarrison at mchenry.edu. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you all for attending today. Uh, we hope to see you back in the coming weeks. We've got some great stuff coming up. So thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.